Hi, this is Jeremy Bryden with Core S Squared Software Solutions. Today I'll be introducing GLUI 2, which stands for OpenGL User Interface Library Version 2. Uh, it's version 2 because it comes from an original library written by another author. So the GLUI OpenGL User Interface Library is meant to be used for simple uh, applications that either already have an existing code base or are written from scratch using the OpenGL uh, graphics library. The entire purpose is to be very small. It's less than 9,000 lines of code or about one megabyte when you compile it in uh, any of the three operating systems. It's also very easy to implement or access any of the features. It uses a factory method system of instantiating objects, so you don't even have to manage the objects yourselves. And also, it's completely themable, meaning if you don't like the default theme, you could easily, using Photoshop or any other image editor, create your own themes. So let me launch example three, which implements all of the features associated with a library. Currently, I'm running an OSX, but the library can be um, executed on any of the two other major platforms, so Windows and also Linux. Currently, the code base does work on all three. Right now, what you see in front of you is a simple OpenGL application, uh, in this case, example three in the code base, that implements all of the features. In the top left is a simple G2 label. It's a bitmap character font, which you could go ahead and change yourself. Uh, from there, you could look at buttons. If you've noticed in the example, you could actually colorize buttons as well as disable them. So I'm actively clicking this disabled button, but it's not interacting, nor does it send a callback push event within the code itself. Also, there's a nice little feature which is operating system uh, specific called the dialog system. So you could either pop up dialogs or attempt to do uh, open or save files. And all of this is dependent on the operating system you're running on. So the Windows experience will be different and specific, while the Linux experience actually just uses the standard input output of a console. We also have text fields, which you could type anything you want. Uh, so here I could be typing hello comma world. And in the other text fields, again, anything I want. You'll notice in the disable field, just like it's described, you can't input anything. What's nice about the text fields, though, is that there's a feature called filter, uh, which allows you to set specifically what characters the user is allowed to input. On the next row, you'll see a toggle console, which turns on and off the console. From here, users can type in whatever commands they want. And within your code, you could do a get s, which gets you the latest string that the user has typed or printf, which is the standard C-style printf function, but it actually gets sent to this stream. You'll also notice in the console, anything that you uh, put in or get printed out also gets pushed there uh, to standard streams. Let me turn off console. Here you have the standard spinner, so you could spin up and down the values. You'll also notice that if I were to try to put in an invalid value such as a letter, A, B, D, uh, nothing gets inputted. It only accepts uh, numeric values. Uh, you'll also notice with a floating point value, uh, it does accept multiple dots. It uses the, um, what is it, the I squared C? No, excuse me, I'm thinking of a different standard. You are allowed to write values such as, um, you know, 10 to the power of 28. So 10 E8. In the drop-down, you're allowed to list a series of uh, elements that the user can access. All you have to do is just drop down, select the element you want, and then release on that button. Uh, also, the progress bar, standard kind of behavior for any other application. Radio group, mutually exclusive selection. Checkbox, you could turn on and off any of the checks. Uh, slider, again, standard behavior, you could slide left to right. You'll notice here that the slider text actually does change, and that's using a live variable. Uh, so every component that you create on screen can either be attached to a live variable, a variable that gets updated as the user changes the form, uh, or you could do a push event callback. So it's a standard function, C-style function, that you could connect with the uh, instantiation of the object so that every time the user changes or does a push event, so for example, the toggle console, it'll execute uh, that function. And then also G2 panel, which isn't implemented in this version of the code. If we look at other examples, there's a couple of cool features. Uh, so in example four, you're able to implement your own custom controllers, which is another big feature within the GLUI2 library. So the graphic you see in the, in the middle of the screen is completely written from scratch independently of GLUI2. 
um, but it's still rendered using the GLUI system, so it's all managed, very simple to use. In example five, though, we get to demonstrate a real-world application and a real-world usage of the GLUI library. So in front of you, you have a torus rendered. We could go ahead and change the distance, as well as the pitch and the yaw of the object. As well as using sliders, you could change the color. You'll notice that the, uh, the color values are represented as percentages. Those are updated using live values. And if you want, you could quit the application by clicking the quit demo button, which is internally calling a C-style callback function. If you want, you could learn much more about the application at code.google.com p slash glui2. Or you could visit my website at cores2, C-O-R-E-S2.com. Thanks for watching.